Well, good morning and welcome to the city. My name is Pastor Tony, and I am the lead pastor of this incredible church that we call the city. If it's your first time with us, I want to tell you, welcome. You're already family. Come on, city family. Can we welcome all of our first-time guests? We want to welcome all of you who are watching online from all different parts of this country and the world. City family, can we give a shout-out to our online campuses? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So listen, this is the second week of the new year for us. Last week, we, we were kind of pushing against the wall a little bit because I was talking about how we all know some things that we ought to be doing, right? Come on, come on, right? And, and, and we know that we are always making these New Year's resolutions. We've got this New Year lingo, New Year, New Me, right? We've got all these things that we know we ought to be doing in the new year. And I'm grateful that in the new year, it gives us an excuse to start. And listen, starting tomorrow, we're going to begin our 21 days of fasting and prayer. And we like to start the year off. Come on, that's okay. Come on. We like to start the year off with 21 days of fasting and prayer because it gives us the opportunity to deny ourselves and to put God first in the new year. It gives us the opportunity to say, God, we believe that you're going to do a new thing, and we're going to do a new thing by putting you first. So we're going to do a 21 days of prayer and fasting starting tomorrow at 6 a.m. We'll be in here for 21 days of prayer and fasting. We'll get you out of here so you can get to work at 7. Amen? But we're going to start that thing tomorrow. I am encouraging every person who has breath in their lungs to be a part of the fast. I, I'm telling you, God is doing incredible things that only God can do. And I want to be able to partner with God. I want to be walking with him in a way that he's doing things in me and through me that make no sense at all. I'm talking about the ridiculous. Everybody say the ridiculous. Everyone's like, I got a word this year. I think I just found my word. It's ridiculous. I'm believing God for the ridiculous this year in 2024. Amen. And, and, and I'm like, man, I'm, so I'm excited about what God is doing. But God does not move outside of order. In other words, God is too incredible and powerful that he can't move outside of order. It's like having something, imagine having um, a nuclear weapon but no protocols. That's dangerous. So God, in his holiness and in his power, he, he's not out of control, which means in order for him to be who he is, he has to move through order because he's so powerful. He's so mighty. And, and we've got to find ourselves in 2024 coming under the order of who God is. So I'm going to kind of push on you a little bit. Come on, everybody say, it's okay, pastor. You can be. A little blunt. You didn't want to say that because I'm always blunt. Okay. I want to push on you a little bit. Because what I've found is this. And I'm not a woman. Right? Right? <laughs> but what I know about women is that I've, had, I've, I've been a part of the process of the birthing of a child. And, and when a woman gets pregnant, we get excited. It's like, man, pregnant. You know, we like, I'm going to have a baby. You start thinking about names. All this stuff begins to take place where you're, you're kind of excited, right? In the beginning, you're nervous. Then as it goes along, you get excited. They're throwing showers for you. You're getting a whole bunch of stuff that you're never going to use. You know, you're buying expensive diapers, not reeling that loves will definitely fill the bill for pee and poop. You know what I'm saying? You don't need a huggy. You need a love, you know? And, and, and you're doing all of these things. But the problem is, in order for the promise to be manifested in the earth, there's going to be some pressure. See, we're excited during the pregnancy because we know there's something inside of us that's growing. There's something inside of us that's beautiful. There's something inside of us that will be created in our own image and likeness. But it doesn't come without pressure. And I'm here to say that God has impregnated you all with a promise. But the promise will never come to fruition unless you allow me to put some pressure on you to push that thing out. 
Now it's going to get a little uncomfortable. Where are the ladies that have had babies in the room? Anybody in here would say it's a little uncomfortable? Just raise your hand if you thought it was a little. Okay. Don't look at her, bro. You were not a part of that. You know what I'm saying? It's uncomfortable, but it's worth it. But you got to go through the pressure in order to hold the promise. So today I'm going to put a little bit of pressure on you. In fact, I'm a believer that many times in the new year we come up with these resolutions that we never fulfill. And then at the next year in 2025, we'll be saying the same old thing. The only difference is another year has passed and time that could have been used has now been wasted that you'll never get back. And the crazy thing is Stephen Covey actually said if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to keep getting what we're getting. In other words, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to keep getting what we're getting. Albert Einstein said it this way, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. You know that there's a different result that God has for you, but you refuse to do something different. You know, I'm not a philosopher or a theologian, so when I looked at Stephen Covey's words, I came up with my own. If nothing changes, nothing changes. It's pretty simple. Am I right? So, so it doesn't, listen, it's not a complex, you know, algorithm that you've got to figure out for your life. But I'm here to actually say to you guys today that your turn is over. Some of you are young in the room and, you know, you've been running your life for 15 years. Some of you are older than 15. I'm not going to mention any names. But you've been running your life for decades. And the truth of the matter is, during your turn, you have had some good things and maybe some positive experiences. But if we're being honest with one another, you're not very good at doing you. In fact, I'm going to go on record and say that you need to... Let go of your turn because now it's God's turn to run your life. I'm going to say that I think God is a better leader and a better, has a better understanding of your life than you do. Because it says in the Bible he knows your beginning from your and you can't remember yesterday, and you have no idea where you're going tomorrow. So I'm going to say today, what if we let go and we let him? What if now it was God's turn? And listen, we do this sometimes, though, right? It's New Year. We're like, man, oh, yeah, pastor, I'm with you, man. I'm going to do 21 days of fasting. I'm going to give God his turn. But we do it like a little kid. Come on. You know what I'm talking about? You got a little kid who's got a toy, and, and they're playing with it, and the other kid wants it. And you say, hey, your turn's over. It's his turn. Right? And then the kid gives the other little boy, you know, the toy, and he's playing with it for five minutes. And then the other kid takes it back. And then you're like, hey, what are you doing? It's his turn. You're like, I, and the kid's like, I gave him a turn for five minutes. You know what I'm talking about? It's, it's like five minutes. And then the crazy thing is the kid who gets the toy back isn't even playing with it. The truth is, not only are you not really good at doing you but you're not even focused enough to be a good you in fact the bible says in romans chapter 13 it says but make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted and taking care of all your day by day obligations that you lose track of time and you doze off oblivious to god right there's gonna be some of you because it'd be like hot in here a little bit and you'll start to doze off if I go past 27 minutes, y'all going to be out, right? But that's okay. I'm going to get down off this stage and wake you up, praise God, on camera, live on YouTube. <laughs> it, we got to be careful because what happens is we get so caught up in our routine that we don't even notice God when God is right there. And it goes on to say, it says, the night is about over. Dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. Now what he's going to do, he's already moving. And it says God is putting the finishing touches on the salvation work that he began when we first believed. In other words, God's ready to complete 
phase one of our life so we can go on to the next phase. But we're oblivious that he wants to take us to a new level. It goes on to say, we can't afford to waste a minute. We must not squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and indulgence and in sleeping around and dissipation. We can't be bickering and grabbing everything in sight. Do you know God gave me a revelation in this message that he's not teaching you patience? That that is a not real thing? Well, yes, he is. Delay is not patience. Delay means you're not doing something you're supposed to be doing because the word of God, and I can take you to scripture after scripture after scripture where it says you can't waste a minute. God has all the time in the world. You don't. You have a limited number of days, and he's not interested in wasting any of them with you waiting around. So if we're waiting and something's not growing, then we need to figure out what we're not doing because God is moving. It goes on to say we got to get out of bed and get dressed. Everybody say, get up. You got to get up. It says, don't loiter and linger, waiting until the very last minute. Oh, Jesus, he's talking to me. Praise God. But it says you got to dress yourselves in Christ and be up and about. So listen, the waiting period is over. It's time. It's time. Everybody say it's time. It's time. Well, what is it time for, Pastor? What is it that we need to be ready for? Well, it's time, number one, for you to take control of your schedule. It's time for you to take control of your schedule. Now, I'm going to be pretty frank with you guys here today. There's, I, I, I try to live a life here and there. Same person on the floor as I am up here, right? That's one of the things my family, my, my staff can tell you, like, he's the same guy. Now, there is an unfiltered version of me um, that I don't share. And I'll be honest, it's because if I shared it, you might not come back. Fair, right? But, but, my, but my children and my family and like the staff here get to see that because it's a straight up truth version. Um, I've even wondered, I'm not going to lie, I'm like, man, I wonder what it would look like if I really just preached a message without pulling any punches and told you guys what was really going on and what we really need to do. And I thought, again, a lot of people would leave. So I'm not going to tell you, but I am going to show you, okay? I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you what it looks like. I'm not going to tell you. And you may be like, come on, pastor, you need to, mm, no, because, because it looks like things like, you know, there, there are some things that you think you want to hear, but you really don't want to hear. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, you know, someone will say to me, that's close, like, well, you know, it's like, hey, if you're doing something you know you shouldn't be doing, go ahead, keep doing it. And you're going to keep getting what you're getting. Go ahead. You know, you keep running into the wall, banging your head, and you got a headache. You know what I'm going to say? Run into the wall again. Hit your, be, how foolish do we have to be? To realize we're running into the wall. The headache is a result of the decision. When you're ready to make a better decision, now I'll get involved. But I'm not going to tell you to do something you're not going to do. So keep getting the result you're getting. You see how you guys are looking at me already? Because, the, listen, truth is something that sets you free. But you have to rem remember that if you're being set free, you're in bondage. Which means there's a restriction in you. And in order to break free, you have to be willing to pull against the restriction. So I'm going to drop some truth bombs on you here in this, this next couple of minutes. And then you're going to decide whether or not 2024 really is going to be a year of miracles, a ridiculous year, or a year of breakthrough. Or you're going to decide, well, I'm just going to keep doing what I've always done. And you know what I'm going to say? Awesome. Keep getting what you're getting. But don't come to me talking about how bad things are. Don't talk to me about how we're depressed and we're, when you're not willing to do anything different. God is not going to move in your life until you move. You've got to do something. 
Jesus told Peter, come and follow. You got to move. I chose you. I selected you, but you got to move. And if you move, I'll use you to confound the wise. I'll have you preach one message. And they'll be like, is that the ignorant, unlearned cussing Peter that's speaking multiple languages and 5,000 people are coming to Christ? That's the one. But you got to come. You got to move. Everybody say you got to move. You got to move. So we got to move. And the first thing we got to do is we got to take control of our schedule. Last year in the last quarter, I'm even doing this with my team. I'm not telling you guys to do something we're not doing. I implemented something called the 12-week year. And what that looks like is if you sit down with me, one of the first questions I'm going to ask you is, what do you do every day? Because everybody in the room, I'm like, hey, man, how you doing? I'm like, oh, man, I'm busy. Everybody's busy. But the problem is, what are you busy doing? And when I started this with my staff, they began to, all of a sudden, things started to unlock in them, in their lives. Because God is a God of order. So it was like, now that I've got this thing, all of a sudden, ministry's changing, growing, moving. Their families are changing, moving, and growing. All these things and all these fruits begin to come out because we got focused. It doesn't mean that you love God more or less. It has nothing to do with that. It means, so what am I saying? I'm not saying that we prioritize our schedule. What I am saying is we got to schedule our priorities. We got to schedule our priorities. So there's a difference. So now all of a sudden, we're taking control of our time. We're taking control of what God has given us, and we're numbering the days with a wisdom saying, God, whatever you need and however you want to do it, I'm available. Jeremiah 6 says this. It says, go stand at the crossroads and look around and ask for directions to the old road. Everybody in the room is here because you believe God has more. You're not happy with what's going on. And that's normal. Me too. But we're standing at the crossroads and God is saying, listen, you got to ask for directions. And it says that the tried, there's a tried and a true road. The road that I'm trying to get you on has been working since the beginning of time. It's tried and true. It didn't just work for Jesus. It's been working for people since the beginning of time. It's tried, it's true. But it goes on to say that you got to discover the right route for your souls, which means you don't know it. You got to discover it. And it says, but they say, nope. We're going, we're not, we're not going that way. That's too much, pastor. You're going too far. It's too much. It says, I, God says, I've even provided watchmen for them to warn them. In other words, he's put people to tell them Right? And it says, but the people said, oh, it's a false alarm. It's a false, it's, come on, pastor. It doesn't concern me. It says, and it says, and so I'm calling in the nations as a witness. Watch what happens. God wants to do something so bad that countries will take notice. So I was like, well, God, I need you to sign me up. So what does it look like? He's like, I got to get first in your schedule. If God's not first in your schedule, you're not living your best life, right? So before you pick your phone up, check Instagram, your emails, before you cook breakfast, we're getting ready to do 21 days. So before you get that coffee, you got to get that first 15. What's that look like? You got to read, pray, and you got to worship. You know, I got a friend of mine who I love how he does it. He's got a, a little section in his house. He's got one of those three wick bath and body candles. Lights that joker up. His coffee machine is scheduled. So it's brewing the cup when he opens his eyes. He grabs his coffee, lights his candle, sits down. And the first thing he does is puts his AirPods in and listens to a worship song to start his day. To get his mind focused. And after that song, he opens up his word and begins to read the word of God for five minutes. And then after that five minutes, 
he prays and asks God for the revelation of what he just read. And he does all that in 15 minutes. Five, 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 15 minutes. So as we get ready to go into 21 days, that's what I'm asking you to do. Five minutes of worship, five minutes of reading, and five minutes of prayer. We're going to give God the first fruit of our day. God, before I do anything, I'm giving it to you. This day is yours. You're in control. You can have it all, God. You can speak to me. Who do I need to make a difference? Like, you just give God the first. And let's see what changes. Let's see what changes. Amen? All right, come on, come on, come on. Number two, we got to regulate what I allow into my mind and my body. All right? Um, The truth is we have no gator filters on our eyes, our ears, or our mouths, but you need a gate on your eyes, your ears, and your mouth. And the reason is your eyes are your place for vision. See, the vision is the future. So what you're looking at is what you're dreaming about. So when you're looking at the wrong things, you're fantasizing about the wrong things, and then the wrong things or the fruit of the wrong things are materializing and manifesting in your life. So the vision in your, what we call the eye gate, you need to be thinking about what's coming in. You need to be thinking about what you're listening to all of the time because whatever you listen to will echo in your mind throughout the day, which is why later on when you're at home for no reason at all, you're going to be in your kitchen and you're going to be like, may I never lose the wonder of your presence, right? Because it's echoing. So what you listen to is echoing the self-talk that's destroying you is an echo of what you've been listening to. And your mouth is important because the Bible says that your mouth is where life and death flow from. This is the fruit of your life. If you don't like where your life is right now, there's a very good chance it's because of what you're saying all of the time. It's just fruit. If you don't like the fruit, you need to speak another tree. Something else needs to shift. So, so these things are important, guys. They're important. And, and again, if I was going to sit down with you, I'd ask you, hey, what music do you listen to? And I'm really confident I could tie your music to your life. I'd ask you, hey, what are you watching? What are you clicking on? I would ask you, how do you talk to people? What kind of language do you use? I would ask you questions like, how much do you drink? Are you using drugs recreationally? Are you on any prescriptions that are no longer prescribed, but you're still using? And honestly, church, I wouldn't demonize it. Like, you wicked, lazy servant that will be gnashing of teeth. (laughs) Go to the lake of, I wouldn't demonize it. I'd actually normalize it because it's real. But I wouldn't let you stay there. It wouldn't, it'd be normal, but it wouldn't be okay. Do you hear me? And listen, that may be you. Okay, it's real. But we can't stay there. We can't live there, right? So we got to get some things back in order in our lives where we're pulling back on some things and we're uprooting other things. I would say to you, and this is a real bold statement, how much non-God things are you going to allow to live in you? You're the one making room for it. How much... Non-God things are, well, how do I, pastor, it's not against the law. Help us. It ain't. It ain't against the law. But you know what Paul said? In 1 Corinthians, he said, I have the right to do anything, you say. He said, but not everything is beneficial. He said, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. The word constructive comes with the word construct, which comes from the word construction, which means everything you're doing doesn't have the support system to build upon. 
So you're building on something that's unstable and weak, and you're wondering why you're not living the life that God has always intended for you to live. So how much of it are you going to allow in? It's literally up to you. It's up to you. So is there a big space, a little space, no space, all space? What is it going to be in your life? Because it's time for me, it's time for you to have accountability because you can't get to where you want to go with these habits. One thing's for sure, they're not working. They're not working. So if we were having a conversation, I'd say, finish this statement. I need to let go of or stop doing and then fill in the blank. I need to let go of or stop doing, and then you fill in the blank. Because the beauty is this. You already know. I know. We, God knows. So what is it? Which leads me to the third thing. We, if I'm anybody, anybody who has spent any significant time with me, if I've mentored them, if they're like a part of my family, a part of our staff, like if I'm spending any significant time with you, I ask everybody this question. What are you doing with your possessions? And it ain't because the church needs them. Because we've got to organize our finances around giving, saving, and living. A lot of us do a lot of living and no giving. A lot of us do a lot of living and saving and no giving. A lot of us will give but don't know how to live or save. But God's way is to give, to save, and to live. It's all of it, which means we're generous. We have enough for today, but we're also prepared for tomorrow. So, so I, I'm, I ask these kinds of questions because, believe it or not, it's, it's in that that you find even sometimes your relationship with him. I can I'm actually going to show you a scripture. So we've got, to, we've got to get organized when it comes to this. Because for some of us, we wonder why it's not working out. It's because you're violating this principle. I am going to share this testimony. Yesterday, someone that I know got a text from someone else that I know. And they've actually started doing the give, the live, and the save in November when we had Dave Ramsey. Yesterday, they went and checked on Credit Karma. Y'all know you can check on your credit, right? How many of y'all know y'all need some good credit? We need good credit around. You know, we need God to help us with our credit. We need that 800 plus, right? They went on there, and 35 of their medical bills miraculously were erased. 35 debts gone. See, you think you need to make more money. God is not, listen, if you made more, you'd just be doing more of what you're already doing. God isn't interested in you getting more first. He's interested in you living the principle first. So it'll make room for more. And what God will do is when you start to do the give, the live, and the save, he'll do what only he can do, which is start erasing stuff that you owed that you'll no longer owe anymore. Because I'm a testimony of God removing $25,000 off the principle of my mortgage. I'm a testimony of God taking my interest rate on my house from 11 to 2%. I'm a witness of what God has done, will do, and continues to do when you put him first. It's not because I made more money. It's because I did my part and then I left room for him. So it don't, listen, I don't need to be the one to pay it off, Joe, as long as it's paid off and gone, right? So we got we to gotta start to follow this, and it impacts us. In fact, when you look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 12, it impacts even our proximity to God. Because he says in there, trust God from the bottom of your heart, and don't try to figure out everything on your own. It says, listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. It says, don't assume that you know it all. Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Honor God with everything that you own. Give him the first and the best, and your barns will burst. Your wine will 
your wine vats will brim over. In other words, that's your joy. It'll brim over. And it says, but don't, dear friend, resent God's discipline. Don't sulk under his loving correction. It's the child he loves that God corrects. It's a father's delight. And I looked up the word discipline. Guess what that comes from? Disciple. But what God showed me is discipline is not always correction. Discipline is a way of life. Which is why he called his 12 followers disciples. Jesus was actually taking them on a three-year journey of disciplines that they would be able to stand on so that they could start the church. And I was like, dang, I always thought discipline was a whooping. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you're going to be disciplined. That meant belt, right? But it's actually a way of life. It's a way that you live. And I was like, man, that's so profound. Because, because listen, <laughs> how about this? You and I are not a product of our circumstances. You and I are actually a product of our disciplines. You're not who you are experiencing what you're experiencing because of circumstances. You are who you are and experiencing what you're experiencing because of your disciplines or lack of. Listen, I, you, I could take God out of the equation, but if I'm disciplined in my eating habits and I go work out every day, my body's going to grow. True or not? The discipline will multiply. Am I right? So it's about us shifting into a life that is a little more disciplined. Look at your neighbor and say, don't worry. Right? Because some of y'all look worried. You're like, oh my God, this guy's getting, right? Don't worry. Because listen, it's a process. But I, I saw something from James Maxwell recently, and he said, greatness isn't in the process. Greatness begins at the start. Anybody can gain momentum and move, but it takes greatness to begin. It takes greatness, which leads me to the fourth and final thing is we got to take time to live our life intentionally. We got to live our lives intentionally, church. We got to start to live an intentional life. You and I can only get where we want to go through those disciplines that I said. Psalms 90 and 12 says this, teach us to number our days and to recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. Every day matters. Every day counts. Every day, every day, every day, every day. I have people say, man, I wish I had what you have, but you don't want to do what I do every day, every day, every day, every day. I saw this fable about a man and he was talking about trees and he said, no matter the circumference or the size of the tree, every tree can fall. He said, all you have to do is every day sharpen your ax and take one swing at the tree. And if you do that consistently over time, whether it's a tiny three-inch tree or a giant redwood tree, anything done over time, even the hard things, will eventually fall. So we got to wake up every morning and swing our ax and hit the tree. What we want to do is cut the tree all down in one day. And then we get worn out. We never cut the tree down and we never go back to swinging the ax. But God is saying, hey, what if you just met me every day consistently for 15 minutes? What if you and I just got together every day? So instead of trying to read the whole Bible because you're on fire, you just took 15 minutes and said, I'm going to spend 15 minutes every day with God. And I'm going to put him first in my life. And what I know is that consistently doing that over time will go further than trying to get all of him in at the last minute. See, God wants to do something in your life that you've never experienced. And he doesn't, listen, God is not greedy. 
He's jealous. But even when we give, he's not like, give me the 90 and live off the 10. Ha, 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 ha. He's like, okay, you got 10 dimes? Just give me one. You keep nine. Because he's generous. But I found in my life, and this is how I live my life, so here's the secret, is I live my life with a rule of five. I call it, it's a rule of five. And this is what it looks like. I spend time with God in prayer. It's the first thing you got to do, right? If he's my friend, I talk to my friends. I spend time with my friends. I tell my friends my problems. My friends encourage me. They help me. That's what I do. The second thing you got to do is you got to study his word. You may look at God's word like Egyptian hieroglyphics when you look at it. It looks, it's in English, but it looks like it's in Spanish or Greek or whatever. But if you do it every day over time, God will begin to remove some things from your eyes and you'll begin to see things in his word that you've never seen. It'll begin to make sense like it's never made sense in your life before. It'll begin to speak to you as if the very voice of God is ministering to your heart in that moment right then. The third thing I got to do is I got to love those people who are close to me. If you know me and we're cool, every time we part, whether it's a hug out here, a phone call or a text, I always say, love you, man. Love you. I find great joy in making guys say that because we don't want, you know, we, we think that you're supposed to be tough. You know, hey, amen, I love you. I got somebody right now I'm working on in the school system. I love him, man. He's a great man. I'm loving on him. And I can't wait till he says it back. And I ain't going to blast him. You know, I ain't going to be like, ah, you said I love you. But I am going to smile. And I might say I love you again one time. <laughs> but we got to love the people that we are close to. And then the fourth thing is every day I want to make a difference in someone's life. Every day when I'm in prayer, every day I'm like, God, Give me someone today that I can encourage or make a difference in their life on today. And you want to know what that does? It helps to keep me in check. Because let me tell you, I can get off check. And so can you. But the way we stay on task is if we have a task. So if I got to make a difference in someone, then I ain't going to be acting some kind of way. And then the fifth thing is I got to take care of myself. What's that look like? It means I need to go to bed. Don't be up till three in the morning watching Suits on Netflix. Go to bed, right? Eat a decent meal. Try to get some kind of exercise, right? You gotta take care, this is your temple. We gotta take care of it. So how do we do the five? Number one, I gotta know what my purpose is. Proverbs 139 and 16 says this. Proverbs 139 and 16 says, you saw me before I was born and you scheduled each day of my life before I began to breathe. Every day was recorded in your book. Leave that scripture up there. And I want you guys to read it again. It says, you saw me before I was born and scheduled each day of my life before I began to breathe. Every day was recorded in your book. Thirty years ago, when I was about 16 years old, this picture was given to a pastor. Someone in our church whose father was a pastor, his children gave him this over 30 years ago. And I never had the opportunity to meet the man that this was given to. And to you, it's probably just a picture. But what you don't realize is that scripture, you saw me before I was born and scheduled each day of my life before I began to breathe is this picture. 
because at 16 years old when I had no idea what the future outcome of my life would be, God was already at work. He had already written my days in his book because 30 years later, this was passed down from that pastor to me. And the symbolism in the picture is it's a church. But inside the church, in between the pews, there's a city. See, God was saying 30 years ago that I've got a gift that I'm going to give you, and it's going to look like a church. And inside the church, there's going to be a city. And the church is going to surround the city, and you're going to make a difference in cities all over the nation and the world. And 30 years from now, I'm going to give you this as a sign that you know that I've called you and I've anointed you to do exactly what it is. I was thinking about this when you weren't thinking about it because I'm God. I couldn't even in my mind create or imagine. And on the banner of the church, it says, go therefore into all the nations and make disciples. So if God had a plan for me 30 years ago, and he was just waiting for me to surrender and to say, you know what, God, I've had my turn. Because listen, at 20 years old, right before I turned 21, in September, my birthday's in November, I surrendered my life to God. Holy. My wife will tell you, I've never backslid. I've ne like, I fool, you know what? I've tried it. My way's not working. God, here you go. And I'm here to tell you, he's never disappointed. I've never regretted. And I've never wondered, well, I wonder how I would have done. Because I know me. And me is no comparison to him. So I'm going to ask you to stand. God has a purpose for you. But you must have a plan. And when you get a plan, you're going to need accountability. In fact, the Bible says that two are better than one. Because if one falls, the other can pick him up. But woe to the one who is alone, for when he falls, there's nobody there for him. That's why we can't do it by ourselves. We got to do it as a family. We got to do it as a church. You know, that person next to you, whether you chose to sit by them or not, you're going to need them. And guess what? They're going to need you too. That's the beauty. So we're going to be believing God for miracles. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make him the center of our life this year. And for a lot of us in the room, that starts tomorrow by denying ourselves of whatever it is that's important in your life. Well, I got to... Okay. I'm not going to argue. But one of the things I won't do, people are like, well, you know, I really feel like the Lord said to me. Okay. But this is what he's saying to us. And God's not a God of disorder. He's a God of order. And I ain't saying you off, but. So it's time. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I wonder if in this moment right now that maybe there might be some of you in the room who you're, it, this is a message you didn't want to hear, but you know it's a message you needed to hear. That it's one of those times in your life that you're like, you know what, God? You're right. I keep grabbing my life back. I keep taking it back. I keep controlling it. Like I, I keep getting and meddling in your affairs and what you're doing. And honestly, it's just time for me 
to make you first and foremost in my life. And honestly, God, I know you're good and I know what you're gonna do is better than what I'm gonna do, but God, I need your faith right now because you know what? It's hard for me. And I need some encouragement and I'm gonna need some help and I'm gonna need, but, but I know this is the time. It's time for me to let go and to offer to you all that I am. So if I'm talking to you and the Holy Spirit is upon you and you know that this is exactly what you need, I'm gonna ask you to just lift your hand so that I can pray for you in this moment. I just wanna pray for you. You don't have to come up here, I just wanna pray. That you know it's just time. You're tired of just saying, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do, and it's this never, it's just time. It's time to be all. All, it's all, it's all. It's not some, it's all. So with all those hands that are lifted, let me just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see every hand that is lifted in this room, God, and you see every person. God, you see, God, their hearts and how much they love you. But God, our sinful nature sometimes keeps us, God, from doing what we know we ought to do. So, Father, in this moment this year, I'm asking you, God, to help me with my unbelief, to increase my trust and my faith in you, that when I want to grab the reins back, God, that you'll hold me back. And, God, I believe that if I'll make you the center of my life, if I'll make you first in my life, that, God, you'll do miracles in my life. And that I hasn't seen nor ear heard of the things that you have prepared and pre-planned for me. For my family. For my children. My grandchildren. And for generations that will come after me. So God, let me be the new thing. The next thing. The thing, God, that maybe the world hasn't seen that we may be a church, a body and a people where heaven comes to earth and victory is proclaimed in the lives of people far from you. But God, let it begin in me first. So Father, I receive your love. I receive your grace. I receive your mercy. I receive your instruction, your discipline, your correction, but I also receive your promise because, God, your promise is good. So, God, I thank you for what you're going to do, and I trust in how you're going to do it. In Jesus' name, and everybody in the room said, Thank you for tuning in today. I hope the message made a difference in your life. Make sure you click the subscribe button. And if you feel like one of your friends could use this message, please share it with them as well. And I want you to know that if you want to support this ministry, you can support this ministry through our giving, which there's a link right below that you can click on as well. But either way, we want to thank you for being a part of our church family. You're making a difference and God has an incredible plan and future for you. So I can't wait to see you next week. God bless you and be the city.